Lovely and welcome to this afternoon's session or this morning still for many of you. So let's have a look at what we've got in store for today. Um, hello and welcome. This session is weaving the voices of lived experience with best practice intergenerational experiences of family violence. Hello and welcome. My name is Sylvia Lapik. I'm the Executive Group Manager, Deputy for Child Youth Protection Services in the ACT. And I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians in the ACT, the land of the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to both elders past, present and emerging. I'd like to acknowledge the contribution they make to the city and surrounding regions. I'd also like to extend that respect to all First Nations people who are joining us in this virtual space today. Welcome and thank you. So what we've got now is just a short little bit about housekeeping and then we'll get straight into the presentations. So apologies if you've already heard this short bit about housekeeping, it's just a duplication from all the other sessions. But for those of you that have not been to any previous sessions, if you do have any questions, please put them into the Q&A section on the screen. And if you have any technical difficulties, please use the live support button at the top of your screen. Now, to view this on the large screen, you can click the arrows in the top right hand video where I am now and the screen will be larger for you. Now, we do have a couple of speakers um, for today. If you do have any questions, pop them in the chat. We'll have a time allocated at the end of the presentation to go through as many questions as we can. If we don't get to all the questions, we certainly will make sure that we get our presenters to pop it into the chat and you can have some of those responses there as well. All right, now that we've got housekeeping out of the way, I'm really, really pleased to introduce our first session for this particular session. Um, this is titled Criminal Identity Development in Practice. Now, our presenter today is Timothy Wharton, who's a Senior Project Officer for Practice in Youth Justice in New South Wales. Tim has worked with adolescents involved in community justice for over 15 years and is currently the Senior Project Officer for Practice in Youth Justice New South Wales. Tim also has a private practice and a PhD examining criminal identity development. He has a passion directly um, related to practice capability development with youth justice frontline staff. I warmly welcome Timothy to the main stage. Thank you. Thanks, Sylvia. Uh, okay. Um, well, okay. so to start with, this is a, a presentation based on my research around criminal identity development uh, for adolescent males, but it's been applied to, uh, with Youth Justice New South Wales, um, been applied to um, treatment for adolescent domestic and family violence. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, but I'd like to start uh, with an acknowledgement. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land. I'm speaking to you from Darug land, which was also used by the Thurwell people, and I acknowledge and pay respect to the elders past, present and emerging. I acknowledge the continuing relationship to the land, the sea and the community and acknowledge the ongoing living culture uh, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples across Australia. Um, and before I move on, I'd also just for my colleagues in Youth Justice and um, others from various universities across the place. I am, this isn't a filter, this is a legit collar, just for, for those who aren't used to it. Um, so, uh, as I said, this is a this is a um, piece of work based on my uh, PhD, and I was very interested in identity, a, a personal and social identity. Um, uh, to get that information out, I um, interviewed 20 young people from uh, age 16 to 18 at Cobham, which is a remand centre in youth justice in Sydney. Um, and those narratives, I, I listened to those narratives and interpreted them through an identity lens. There's lots more to be said uh, about that, but I've only got a short period of time, so I'm going to blast through a lot. Um, but to make the rest of it make sense, I really need to uh, give a bit of a note on human identity. I, I took, uh, when I embarked on this study, I, I took human identity for granted. I just, just sort of thought it was a word that I knew what it meant, uh, and then realised there are a whole gamut of people, psychologists and social psychologists in particular, um, that have devoted their lives to this study. Um, so in brief, very brief, because there's so much more to it than this, um, 
I've considered uh, human identity in sort of the following realms of personal identity, social identity, and how it develops. Um, so your personal, personal identity is essentially your uniqueness in your roles and the beliefs that you hold and are committed to, so your ideologies. Then you've got your social uh, identity, which includes your group membership, who you belong to and any belonging there, your out-group comparisons. So if you belong to one group, those people over there are different, um, and, and that's important too. Uh, and the way that the group thinks also influences how you think and how you see yourself. So that's your social identity. And then I was also very interested in how identity develops, um, and that became very important over the course of this study. Uh, I'll talk about this a bit later, but it's essentially, uh, when it all boils down, it's essentially a, um, uh, I suppose, a, an intersection between levels of exploration and thinking about um, a sort of an identity issue and committing to it, whether or not you are committed to it or not. Um, identity also has really significant, uh, like a really significant purpose in behaviour, which is why I was also interested in it in relation to crime. Um, it directs and filters and processes information. It manages how you're impressed by things. Um, it provides a, st a structure for understanding how you are and what you do, and it gives you uh, meaning through the things that you're committed to, your beliefs um, and your values. So just a real quick run through about uh, um, the findings that I came to. Um, so just move that. Um, so youth justice clients can be considered to hold, uh, in general, they can, can be considered to hold a high and influential level of personal and social criminal identity. So I found that it was there um, and there really prominently. Uh, keeping in mind, this is not um, generalizable. This was a very small um, cohort. It was only 20 young people, but it's worth investigating further, I think. Um, I found that there were certain events and social circumstances that contributed to identity in a really significant way. And I found, um, I mentioned before, um, ideology or core beliefs were really important to your identity. And I found five distinct ideologies, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, I also found that the general identity literature is really, really applicable, particularly the identity status model, which is the exploration and commitment thing, really applicable, um, I think. Um, and these are some of the ideas that we've, uh, that Youth Justice New South Wales has now um, overlaid uh, at, onto um, our new domestic and family violence treatment program. Uh, I also found that a social identity was more prevalent than a personal identity. So just keeping in mind that the differences here, the personal one is, is more about how you see yourself and your uniqueness and your roles. Your social is more about the people around you. So those ideologies, I found five distinct criminal ideologies that were closely related to your self-concept uh, as an adolescent uh, in, in a romance center anyway. The first one I found was criminal notoriety. That was essentially your reputation. Um, and that reputation was around uh, your the idea of, of um, criminal readiness, like you're ready to go. Boys need you, you're, you're on. I also found that uh, your reputation was also closely related to crime with or against adults. So if you if you fought with adults, or, you know you were violent um, against adults, or you did crime with adults, that meant you sort of were existing at a higher level. You were punching above your weight, so to speak. Then there was criminal eff efficacy, uh, and that was essentially a theme that was really um, focused around being good at, at crime or effective at it. Um, and the, the, your social identity was important here too. Everyone had to know that you were good, uh, and it had to do with specialized skill or knowledge. Uh, then, then there was this idea that uh, a criminal identity was had use. It was useful. It had va it had value, and there was a significant loss if if um, crime was deleted from your life tomorrow. That would be a real loss to you. It would be something that you would be bereaved of. The next and sort of most prominent finding was uh, around violence, and there were two sub themes there. I should have bolded these, but whatever. Um, I, I found that there was a, a violent social identity that all bar one of the participants had really strongly. And this was an identity that was um, characterized by two things. One, it was, uh, you know, if you could call on your friends for, for violence if you need be, and they'd all, be, they'd all have your back. So that was about that group membership that was related to violence. Um, and secondly, everyone knew you could fight. So it was really important that you would fight and you wouldn't back down. The severe violent identity 
uh, I, co I coded as something different. It was much more related to a personal identity than a social one. The young people that had where this, where this came through, they weren't really concerned what other people thought. It was a problem solving skill. Um, they weren't really too concerned where, whether or not other people had it or didn't, um, but it was very important to them. That's just, it was just a, a thing that you do in the same way that, you know, you might hold an identity about a particular job that others don't. Uh, then finally, the last one was about a maturation of identity, uh, which was a very interesting one. It was it was one where it was sort of a projected identity where you could say that um, in the future, it's OK to mature out of a criminal identity. You don't need to be known as a criminal anymore, but it was important to be able to say I've been there, done that. A historic criminal identity is maintained, um, except for violence. <laughs> that was important to you always had to be violent. So if someone or at least be able to violently protect yourself. Um, that, that was really important. That was the only one that wasn't lost. And in terms of weaving the voices, I've got so many voices that I want to talk about, but I'm, I'm only going to be able to talk about two just because of the time constraints. But I thought this one was was potentially powerful, I, I think, anyway. Um, and this was uh, one of the um, uh, meaning units that I coded to uh, line up with the value of a criminal identity. Uh, and I asked the young person, so what would you lose, say, if you came up with some good strategies to keep away from crime? He replied, I'd lose my street smart uh, because becoming a good person, you wouldn't really need to use street smart no more because you're not in trouble no more. OK, like I lose all my techniques. I lose it all. I lose my friends and that. Yeah. So there was this idea that if he lost, if he if he went down a path of, you know, um, it's that thing that people say all the time, the right path. Um, that would he, he'd have a, there'd be a loss there, um, and it wouldn't just be a, a loss of uh, personal identity about here that you'd, you'd lose your street smart, which meant at the time it meant he was able to break into houses um, and get away from police, but he'd also lose his friends uh, and therefore his social identity. So, so those are the ideologies; those are the criminal identity ideologies that people were committed to. The other thing I found that was very interesting were identity forming events and social influences. So the first three, your offences, your arrest experiences and your court experiences were all quite similar. They had this idea that the first time it happens, it was a big um, uh, crisis point, identity crisis point. And then there's this idea that the more you do it as a subsequent normalising this, it's sort of this is me now experience. What was also interesting, I thought, was uh, the arrests in public and the arrests in front of peers were extraordinarily powerful. Generally speaking, arrests in public, uh, uh, the young people thought, everyone that was watching them thought they were a little scumbag. Um, and that is important to your identity. That has identity and formula implications. And I could talk about that at length from the perspective of the identity literature. Uh, but being arrested in front of your peers was a little bit different. That was a, bit, a little bit of notoriety. That's how you protect yourself from the shame, I suppose, of um, being arrested. Is that it, um, you know you're the, you're you're taking it for the team. Uh, then there was uh, the impact of family was interesting. Uh, if you have high crime rates in your family, you're not thinking about it so much. You just take on a criminal identity and you don't explore it all that much. It's just how it is. If you've got pro-social influences in your family, you're much more likely to have significant identity crises with really complex and sophisticated justifications around those ideologies. You have to think about it because you're in a place of cognitive dissonance. You have to, you know, you know you have, you've got to really grapple with it. Uh, peers were also important. The group membership and what they thought of you was also important. But another finding that was really consistent uh, was group mobility. Um, so there was a, there were a cohort of kids that could move between pro-social and pro-criminal groups. In the pro-social group, they were they believed they were revered for being a part of a pro-criminal group. Then there were another bunch of kids that couldn't go into pro-social groups. That was terrifying. That was not their group. That was an out-group comparison and not going there. Too 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 scary. Uh, the last one I found was consistently were school experiences. That was real big for in-group and out-group comparisons. School is a commitment for others. I'm not a school kid. I'm not. That's not. I just have to go there. Um, if I do go there. And there was an antisocial reflected appraisal from teachers, which means that they believed that the kid, that the, the young people believed that um, the teachers thought they were no good. And they knew that. And there's some really powerful voices in this. Um, just as a side note, I'm 
planning on uh, publishing a paper on the impact of family and identity uh, with a colleague from University of Newcastle soon. Um, and that will talk about that in great detail because it's a really, really powerful one for practice too. Anyway, that's enough spooky. Um, in terms of weaving voices, again, this is another one about um, being arrested in public. This was a part of a much bigger narrative. Um, but I asked, is there anything good about that getting arrested where everyone could see it? A young person said, yeah, yeah, at first, you could tell it was Australia, right? Nah, yeah. Nah, yeah, at first I thought it was good getting arrested in public. Um, and the young person said, yeah, why? Because like it's, get, it's like fun getting arrested. I'm like, yeah, getting arrested, big shot, that. And then I realised, no, nah, you know, people look at you as a bad person and they say, um, say there was a girl you want to take to the movies and she's seen you getting arrested, she ain't going to go with you, you know what I mean? Um, sometimes, like for people in the community, I don't want them knowing I'm a bad kid. I want them to think I'm a good kid uh, and that, but they find out either way because I keep getting arrested. So it's a real, for this young person, it was a real problem being arrested in public. The subsequent identity um, ramifications were, though, for being arrested in public that he believed he was sore as a criminal, so he took on that label and identity. Um, how am I going to time? So the identity status model, this is what I talked about earlier. This is about um, how you, how identity develops. And it's an um, intersection between exploration and commitment. Um, and we found that, uh, we, I found that most interestingly, there is something about um, being thrust into the criminal justice system that makes you really think about your identity in some way, shape or form. In the general identity literature, diff diffusion is a status where you just are not thinking about it. You're not exploring anything, you're not committed to anything, but as an adolescent, you don't care anyway. You're just playing video games and you're just, okay, sorting things out. Um, this didn't happen at all in um, for, for, for in the cohort, it wasn't there. They were all thinking about it or they were all committed to something. So this is a really important piece that I don't have time to talk about now. Um, so the other thing, so the implications for practice, uh, I wanted to talk about very briefly that when we're asking young people to stop doing crime, we are really proposing, from an identity perspective, we're really proposing something different. We're really saying that there's a, um, you know, we're asking them to stop doing what they think they're good at, remove them from the peers that they provide them a space to fit in and social belonging and being liked uh, and likeness. Um, and we're asking them to stop doing the things that make them feel unique and useful. We're, all, we're potentially asking them to have a blank canvas with no role or social belonging. Um, now, that doesn't mean we just don't do anything. Um, I think that the identity uh, work on identity can really promote um, uh, uh, sort of a speedway to desistance. So I'm not talking about risk management anymore. I'm talking about getting them to a place where they're just done with crime, which is something desistance literature talks a lot about. Um, people who have stopped crime altogether often, or, or really or, or quite often, talk about uh, a complete change in identity. I'm too old for this. I'm a father now. I've got a job. I'm just I'm a new person. The identity work is really um, applicable as well to uh, sort of tried and true offender treatment models, CBT problem solving models and whatnot. Um, it's also really important to keep in mind that nonviolence is socially very hard, you know, it, the, the word bitch was used so much in my findings. You know, if you, if you walk away from a fight, you are just a flop, you're a bitch and, and you're out, you're out, you're out in the out group. Um, so it's, it's not just sort of saying, thank you. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm the bigger man because no one else thinks you're the bigger man. So it's really hard. Um, uh, the other thing as well is pro-social models provide a really good framework of understanding for a new respectable identity. So if you're working with a young person and they like you and they respect you, you are potentially a framework for a new identity that they can grasp. Um, in terms of operational practice, uh, a couple of things. If I uh, don't want to tell police how to do their job, but if you can avoid arresting a young person in any sort of public space, avoid it. Because <laughs> whenever someone watches you uh, become arrested, you're taking on a criminal identity. You take on a criminal identity. What do criminals do, right? You've got a criminal identity. Criminals do crime. Avoid it. Uh, courts, children's courts are closed, but the waiting room isn't. There's lots of in group comparisons. You know, I'm part of the waiting room crew, uh, but I'm not part of the court staff. That's more identity forming stuff. Um, 
And for youth justice direct practice, I would just say that we need to really be aware of what we're asking young people to do in terms of identity and always keep in mind they're humans, not youth justice clients. So that's uh, that's a wrap. Uh, there's so, so much more to talk about this, but I'm really pressed for time and did want to leave maybe five or 10 seconds for half a question. Lovely. Thank you so much, Timothy, for sharing uh, your very important research and findings there. And I couldn't help myself when you had the five um, criminal identity ideologies up on the on the screen and just started thinking about individual children and case studies yes. that, you know, you just can't help Over yourself. Yeah, right. Mm. It's just really good application. And I can see that application in practice and um, being a really good foundation for our, our work moving forward mm. and really look forward to the impact of the family um, paper that's coming out as well. So yeah. thank you for that. That's really good. No we probably have time for one or two questions. So let's okay. see if we can get to those. Um, we have a comment here. It's a very interesting piece of work that you have um, completed here. Do you think this relates to labelling theory? and young people using this criminal identity to cope with um, and better and feel better about dealing with police, courts and custody? Yes. In short, yes. So mm. I, labelling theory was uh, possibly my most influential theory, that and symbolic, uh, symbolic interactionism uh, when I was developing my um, questions and, and thinking about this. Um, so yes, what, I, what was interesting did, with the younger kids, it seemed to be about dealing with and coping with it. Then after it became normal, there wasn't that there wasn't much of a need to cope with it, but they'd still taken on that label. They were just comf not comfortable, but they were more, more comfortable in, in that space. So the older the kid, um, and it, that sort of matches with the um, second idea of secondary deviance in labeling theory as well. Um, but generally, the older the young person, um, the less they had to cope with it, but the label was strong. The younger they were, uh, the label was, keep in mind there's only 20 young people, but the younger they were, the more that they use the label to cope as well and defend themselves. Mm, that's great. Thank you. Look, I'm going to squeeze one more really important question sure. in from Shelley Turner. Um, very interesting findings about the benefits of criminal identity and what a young person might lose by changing. I would agree. Suggests we should work with this in a similar way to how we deal with AOD issues, like a motivational interviewing approach. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, possibly. One thing I found, I, I assumed, based on my own child, childhood, adolescence, that there was a strong relationship between AOD use and identity. There's actually, I didn't find that at all. It was actually a, a, quite the opposite. Um, there was this idea that if you're not, you, you know, you're not smoking, it's more for me. And, and if almost if you were pressured, that was a sign of weakness. So this idea of uh, drug use wasn't closely related to identity, but, uh, but yes, but I see that the, um, in brief, I see a lot of um, really good use out of MI and, and exploring identity crisis, um, that's that's a big question that I'll put a hold on there because I think Jeff's asked yeah. a question too. That sounds great. Look, I know there's a couple more questions in the chat. Um, we also have some comments oh, yeah. and feedback in our discussion forum. Um, Timothy, it would be great if we can pop back in and put some comments back into there so that um, all our questions can be answered. But I just want to formally thank you. That was a really interesting study and um, look forward to what's next in that space. So no thank worries. you so much, Timothy. Cheers. Thanks, Sylvia. Lovely. Thank you. All right. Which that this brings us to our next session. So our next session is titled Kind, Early Intervention Addressing Adolescent Family Violence and Adolescent Dating Violence. Now this um, session, our, our presenter is Kate Melvin from our Youth Justice Assessment and Intervention Service. Kate is a senior family violence therapist working within Youth Justice Assessment and Intervention Service. She's also a social worker with an interest in early intervention for adolescent uh, perpetrators. Kate has trained in multiple therapeutic interventions and has worked with both perpetrators and victims of violence, um, family, domestic and sexual violence. I warmly welcome Kate to the main stage. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the First Nations people as the traditional owners of the Ghana land on which this presentation is taking place in Adelaide. And I'd like to recognise the country and land and traditional owners of each participant watching today. And I pay deep respects to all elders, past, present and future, and future leaders. Thank you for having me. 
Um, so I work in a intervention called KIND, which is based in South Australia, um, and it's working with adolescent intimate partner violence and adolescent family violence. I sit across um, youth justice, so all of the um, areas. So I sit within the training centre, community youth justice and referrals from courts as well. Um, so KIND is an acronym. So K is for kinship, and that's really the recognition that um, family is really important part of identity and an important part of adolescence um, life, but that kinship can also be complex um, and broad for young people. So the program recognises uh, family as whoever the young person views as part of that family. Um, improving relationships. So again, the recognition that within family violence for adolescents, um, there is often a desire for parties for a relationship to remain in place. So, and that often there's not, sorry, I think my screen might be going in and out. So hopefully you can still hear me. I'm not sure why that's happening, um, but hopefully you can still um, hear what I'm saying. So improving relationships, yeah, it's that recognition that there is that, that desire for relationships to continue. Um, no violence, so working around um, a zero tolerance for the use of violence in relationships and how can that be achieved. Um, and D is for developing skills. So again, that recognition that sometimes the young people and the families we're working with they really need to develop skills in how can we have healthy and safe relationships and what does that look like? Um, I'm also having difficulty sharing my screen, so there we go. So if we look at the prevalence of um, violence, um, of adolescent family violence and adolescent intimate partner violence, there is limited research and literature in this area and that's globally and within Australia. Um, violence is considered to be physical, verbal, emotional, financial, sexual or technological for the KIND program and can be perpetrated, as I said before, against anyone within that family and also with partners. Um, I'll talk about the criteria in a moment. So within adolescent family violence, there is a growing recognition of how prevalent this is within populations. So a systemic review in 2017 showed that within the community, we're looking at about one in 10 families. But when we talk about our populations of youth justice or within a clinical um, population, we're actually looking at one in four. So that highlights that need for us to really be doing that screening early on when we're meeting clients. Um, often the charges of the young people that I'm seeing, it's not related to the use of violence in relationships. So it's about then looking holistically at what's happening for that young person in their life and is there that use of violence in relationships. When we're looking at intimate partner violence, again, really um, uh, small amounts of data for Australia around how prevalent this is. Um, and again, 2017, there was... Um, an audit done of the Victorian Royal Commission into Family Violence of phone calls that, um, involving adolescent family violence. And it indicated that in fact, 16.5% um, of those calls were actually in relation, in relation to adolescent intimate partner violence. So again, sometimes the data that we're drawing on is actually um, not speaking to what's actually happening within those family groups. Sorry, I am having technical difficulties. So KIND, the background of KIND is that it was developed in 2017 um, by a psychologist in Adelaide called Lauren Moulds. Um, it was piloted and for 12 months and it had good outcomes. Um, and there was a small evaluation that was done at that time. Sorry, I can work with adolescents, but the computing systems just aren't being kind to me today. 
Um, the KIND program was re-implemented in 2021 and that was as a result of the increase in violence that was being reported due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, I came on in February and have been running with KIND since then. Um, there's been really good uptake of the program. So the criteria for South Australia for KIND is 12 to 18 years old um, and having current contact within the youth justice system. So that can be quite broad. Um, it can be a family diversion. Um, it can be a mandate, but the charges don't have to be related to adolescent family violence or intimate partner violence. It's where there's a pattern of behaviour. So really important for that assessment to occur. Was this occurring in self-defence or was it a one-off incident? So it does need to be where there's a pattern. Um, KIND is a voluntary service. So I think we know that, you know, undertaking a therapeutic intervention with young people, there needs to be motivation and engagement. Um, in saying that, I have a few young people who are being mandated through family conferencing. And that mandate is saying that you have to meet once with me just to talk about the option of doing KIND. And so far, all of the young people have taken that up. I'm also able to continue post mandate, which has been really important because if a young person's partway through the intervention, obviously completing that um, is positive for them. And again, so far, everybody whose mandate has finished has continued to do that work with me. So it is a perpetrator focused program. Um, the word perpetrator is one that I don't use with young people. So I talk about use of violence in relationships. The reason for that um, is there's a few reasons. One, the label of perpetrator is quite loaded um, and can be really confronting, obviously, for everybody um, to hear that word. So talking about use of violence in relationships allows for there's still to be responsibility and accountability taken and I guess the recognition that there is that violence used, but it's also not labelling that young person in a way where they may have had other experiences of perpetrators of violence. So a lot of the young people that I'm working with, there is that experience of having witnessed domestic violence as a young person. Um, so, yeah, just language is really important, as we know. Using language like um, the use of violence in relationships has also been really helpful in pulling out the young person's experiences of victimisation. So a lot of the young people I'm working with, not only have they witnessed DV, for some of the relationships there's mutual violence. So when we're talking about intimate Sometimes it is mutual, which is a difference between adult um, domestic violence and adolescent intimate partner violence. Just being really mindful of the language that I use when I'm with young people, but the perpetrator focus program. Kind intervention also works with family, with that cultural understanding of who family is to that young person. Um, so work is done individually with the young but it's also done with the victim of that violence. And then there are some joint sessions. So, um, and I'll show you briefly what that looks like. Again, that's voluntary. So not every young person I'm working with has a um, partner or parent who I'm working with, but that option is there. So KIND is based on the principles of restorative justice, hence the working alongside the victim. It really gives a voice to that victim, um, builds the capacity and skills of the victim and the perpetrator and works towards positive um, relationships. So as I kind of talked about in the beginning, when we're talking about family violence, there's a lot of blame and shame that occurs for parents. So there's also a really strong desire to have a relationship with the young person in their life whatever that may look like, whether that's that they can still live together or whether they live separately, but they still want to have some relationship. So restorative um, approaches really lend to that. When we're talking about working with partners, often there is um, a difference where maybe the young person does want to separate, but often I'm finding there isn't. They do still want to maintain a relationship. 
um, the differences between adult domestic violence and adolescent intimate partner violence is there's often different, um, I guess, environmental factors for the young person. The young people aren't living together. They don't share resources. They might not be financially dependent on each other, um, don't have children together. But there's also other influences for that victim where they may have a teacher or a counsellor or family members or different peers who are also concerned about that young person. So they're, um, yeah, I'm finding from adult domestic violence work that I've done in the past, there is often a different um, desire from that young person. They may still want to be with their partner, but they'd also like to learn some skills for life in how to manage, you know, conflict, but also, yeah, gaining, um, I guess, confidence in their decisions within relationships. So adolescent development is another principle which is really looking at, you know, where is that young person sitting in terms of development? We know that the adolescent brain is still developing, it's still being shaped. So really taking the time to um, work at that young person's um, pace and where they're at. Um, a family systems approach, so that recognition that each family is um, and what are the functions of each person. So that's been really important and especially when doing work with parents and also with um, the joint um, sessions that we do. It's a trauma-informed program and it's tailored to the individual need of the young person and their So the aims are, there we go, really look at family relationships, helping people to recognise what are some of the triggers that occur for the parties involved and how can we manage them differently? So how can we problem solve differently? How can we use self-reflection on our own behaviour and not just that of the, um, you know, perpetrator in the heat of the moment, but really in the whole of relationship? How can we, yeah, be a bit more reflective into, onto how we impact that young person? Um, an increased understanding of the impact of the violence on the whole of family and on that intimate partner relationship, building the strengths of the perpetrator as well as the victim. Pardon? Oh. Thank you. Um, looking at a reduction in the stigma related to um, IPV and AFV and really looking at safety planning. So that is an integral part of every session is safety planning not just for the young person, um, oh, sorry, not just for the victim, but for the young person as well. So how do we keep the victim safe? But also how do we keep the perpetrator safe from future offending? So a safety plan is done in each session. So the structure, I'm going to hurry along now. There are nine modules. Um, they're called modules because they used to be called sessions and I found that they often won't take one session. That's dependent upon the young person's ability to engage, ability to kind of complete a module. So there's nine modules. Each module has a, um, a particular topic that we follow. Then there are parent or partner modules. And then there are joint sessions as well. So we will do a bit of work individually and then come together and have a joint session where we will share some of the, I guess, safety planning. Um, I'll go to the next slide. Some of the safety planning um, around, you know, what have we found to be useful so that there's a shared understanding when we're talking about family violence. When we're talking about intimate partner violence, obviously we do things differently because the safety of the victim is a bit different. Um, we have a check-in. We're looking at an emotional regulation skill, so really practising Thank you. Um, really practising that in the session and um, emotional regulation skill, which is another big part of um, the kind intervention, that understanding that for some of our young people, because of the complex trauma that they've experienced, there are difficulties with regulation. And then an actual skill that we will do. So it might be problem solving, it might be assertive communication, chain analysis, looking at values. So those four areas are covered in each session. Um, Queensland Youth Justice and Queensland Forensic Child and Youth Mental Health <clears throat> were interested in KIND in 2017. 
So this year I've gone over there and they are trained to deliver kind. They're implementing that in February of 2022. Brisbane Youth Service have also trained in it and um, will be have started. And really exciting is Griffith University is undertaking um, an evaluation of kind next year. That will be across both jurisdictions and will there's two parts to that one is to really get that understanding about kind as an intervention and you know how effective it is but the other part of that is to help to gather some data on adolescent family violence and intimate um, partner violence as well so i'm not sure if there's any questions Lovely. Look, thank you so much for your um, presentation, um, Kate. That was really insightful for us and I'm really keen to see the outcome of the evaluation from Griffith um, University. Keen to see what the outcomes are there um, and, and really keen to look at how we can apply those in different fields. So that would be really interesting. Um, I'm looking, I'm wondering myself around implementation um, of this model and have mm. you had any early insights or learnings about some implementation strategies that have been effective, knowing that they are implementing in Queensland in 2022. Any insights or learnings or considerations that we should think about? Yeah, so I guess, um, so once a month I'm meeting with the clinicians in Queensland. So we have a community of practice, which is also really good. I'm a lone practitioner in South Australia, so that's been really good for me as well. And I guess what has come about from, um, you know, those discussions is that KIND really needs to be delivered and implemented by a sole clinician. So I work alongside the community youth justice case managers, but I only do KIND. Um, so certainly Brisbane Youth Service have talked about, you know, when they started to implement it, they realised that doing both of those roles really complicates, um, yeah, kind of the program and the work that you're doing. And it's much easier to get drawn away from undertaking kind. So there is, um, I guess, that consideration. It is also a big piece of work to do. So, you know, I have clients where I'm working with both parents and the other young, the other young person in the house. So that's actually one client, but it's actually four clients. So just being mindful of, yeah, the space that kind needs. Um, I have found referral-wise there's a massive need for it, so certainly not wanting for referrals. So, again, you know, there's not, um, certainly in South Australia, there's not many um, perpetrator programs for young people, so there's a high need. So, again, just being able to have the space for that implementation. That's great. Thank you. I think some food for thought for us around, you know, the investment in implementation really um, does ensure the effectiveness of program delivery as we move forward. So really great insights. Thank you. I do have uh, a question in our chat. Uh, what have you found has been the biggest takeaway for young people that complete this program? What are their biggest learnings or shift um, and in their opinion? Mm. So absolutely the one that comes to mind is how broad violence can be and the definition of violence. So for most young people and for some young people, there's no physical violence. So they don't even understand why they've been referred in. And then by the end of the program, um, so there's pre and post assessments and they really pull out, um, you know, that young person's view of violence and their use of violence. Um, the recognition around coercive control, around technological abuse and financial abuse. I would say that that's the biggest learning that young people um, have recognised and impact on client, as uh, on victim as well, um, is certainly something that young people are talking about kind of in that um, post-kind intervention catch-up that we have. 
Yeah, good to hear those thoughts as well. Um, look, I have a comment here from Shelley Turner um, saying, thank you, Kate. This is an overlooked issue in a lot of the key family violence policy documents and frameworks. And it's great that you're working to bring attention to this and to address it. So that's great work and thank you. And I particularly liked the application. I know this is a voluntary uh, program, um, mm -hmm. but I liked how you were able to somewhat influence the family group conferencing process or FGC mm -hmm. in order to elicit, uh, I guess, you know, participation from the young person through that method as well, mm -hmm. which means, yes, it's voluntary, but we can influence in a way. So that was a really good application, an interesting one as well. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, and Christine Franks also said, very insightful, very mean meaningful and very important piece of work for our communities and great work. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for those comments and for those questions. If anyone else has any other questions for Kate, please feel free to pop them in the discussion forum or in the live Q&A and we'll be very happy to answer any further questions. But I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Kate for your time today and for sharing those insights. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Um, look, that does bring us to the end of our session for today. Um, we are, you've got a couple of options. You can jump into another session now um, or you could take a nice probably rest and restore break, um, have some fluids, stretch your legs and be back for a really interesting keynote um, addressed by Judge Lewis um, Bido, who's the National Rangatani Court Judge for um, Courts in New, New Zealand. So don't miss out on that keynote address this afternoon. It will be back on Australian Eastern Standard Time 11.50 um, and at 1.50 for New Zealand time. So don't miss out on that. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for listening and I uh, look forward to seeing you uh, at the end of the session. Thank you so much.